Today is what they call Esther. And I gave you the original pronunciation. Esther. Which is spelled E-O-S-T-R-E. -E. And of course, Esther was a pagan European sex goddess. And of course, the Europeans used to practice this, this rite. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Europeans used to practice this thing of this time of the year because it was all about sex. It was all about having children, fertility. That's where the Easter Bunny comes in. Because when you really get right down to it, y'all, uh, you, you figure out how does the rabbit fit in to Easter. What does the rabbit have to do with Jesus getting up out of the ground, right? Uh, so we got to understand this European pagan practice of Esther, where they would actually take their white women and paint them different pastel colors and send them out into the woods naked painted pink, green, purple, red, yellow, representing the other races on the planet. And they'd run out into the woods and hide. And the men would go out and search for them in the woods and find them. And whatever women, painted women they found, they would engage in sexual activity with them. It's a part of their pagan rite of Esther. And as a result of painting these white women and making them go out in the woods and hide and the men would go out and hunt for them and find them, our children today carry out that same practice disguised as what is called the Easter egg hunt. Which some of y'all might take your children to today, I hope not. Even though the children don't know that it is an ancient pagan rite. You'd be surprised the stuff we participate in ignorantly. Like Christianity. Ignorantly, because we were raised in it. Like Islam. I didn't get as many amens that time. Ignorantly because we were raised in it. Like Judaism, or what our people choose to call themselves today, Hebrew Israelites. Ignorantly because they were raised in it and we have lost an awareness of who we are. And because we have forgotten or don't, well many of us don't know who we are because we weren't taught who we are. And as a result of forgetting who we are, we look to the literature that our oppressors wrote to find an identity for ourselves. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So what we do is we go to the Bible, we go to the Quran, we go to the Torah, we go to the Talmud trying to find an identity. And we saw something in the Bible that said that the Jews were God's chosen people. We found that in the Bible and we found where the Bible said, I have chosen you above all other people on the earth and thou art a holy and special people unto me. And whosoever blesses you, I will bless them. Whosoever curses you, I will curse them. And we are so low in self-esteem yes. that we thought we'd assume that identity to make ourselves feel special and important. And now we're calling ourselves Hebrew Israelites not knowing that that is a lie, that is a fabrication, that is an epitome because there was nobody called Israel. 
I didn't even talk about get to the title. I just started talking and I would make sense to you. There was nobody called Israel. According, if you know your Bible, the guy Israel was known as Jacob. And Jacob, according to the Bible, wrestled with the angel. Mind here, we got a human being wrestling with an angel. Okay, come on. And he beats the angel. Look at somebody and say, there's another idiotic concept in the Bible. He beats the angel. Oh, this is deep, man. And because he beats the angel, now the angel is a super human being, right? But this little faggotized dude, Jacob, beats this angel and God decides to change his name from Jacob. I'm no longer going to call you Jacob. I'm going to call you Israel. But the problem is Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham who the Bible says never existed. What I want to talk about today, y'all, is a continuation of this madness. I hope it makes sense to you. <clears throat> Many of you here know the truth, so this message may not be for you unless you are a visitor and you're not aware of what our African story is. So if you are a visitor, please understand, I don't mean to insult your belief system, I don't mean to offend you in any way whatsoever, because I've come to learn that you can't reach a person by offending them. So since you understand, I don't mean to offend anybody, I'm going to ask you to do this with me. All right, everybody, those of you who are here, you already know it. Some of you already know about heart, but just in case we have some visitors, and of course, those of you who are watching this DVD, I know you need to do this. Repeat after me. The space inside this circle. Now, I need, I need y'all to unfold your arms and do this, because the very fact that, that y'all are doing it telling me you're already having a problem with what I'm saying. And I, I want y'all to hear me today. Close your eyes if you want to, but you can't close your ears. And everybody say this, once you hear a thing, you can't unhear it. All right, say this please. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. All that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented right here inside this circle. I must keep in mind that there is more to know than what is within my little tiny circle. Everybody got that? Now having said that, can I teach you? I'm asking your permission now. Can I teach you? And the reason why I'm asking can I teach you is because in order for me to teach you, I have to say something to you that you don't already know. Are we clear? Because if I'm only saying what you already know, then I'm not teaching you anything. You're not learning and I'm not teaching. All right, y'all ready? Yes. Minister Stewart, if you will get for me on this day in particular, 1 Corinthians, <coughs> excuse me, the 15th chapter, the 14th verse. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 14th verse. This day is not only known as Esther or Easter among the secular world and the church, but for Christians and religious people, it is also called Resurrection Sunday. Why? Why is it called Resurrection Sunday? Because he arose, he arose, he rose from the dead, he rose, right? 
That's what we've been taught. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time you need him, he's always near. You know white folk wrote that. <laughs> he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation too important. Now here's the deep part. You ask me how I know he lives. What's the rest of the answer? He lives within my heart. That's the evidence that he lives. Because he lives within your heart. There's no other evidence, nowhere else. Let's read one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. It is also one of the most dangerous verses in the Bible. It's a verse in the Bible that most Christians don't even know is there. It's 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 14th verse. What does it say, Minister Stewart? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. All right. Everybody repeat after me. If, if Christ, Christ be, not be not risen. Now it's interesting, that's the subject for today, by the way. If Christ be not risen. I'm still dealing with the spirit of being in Ghana, <clears throat> excuse me, and seeing the effect that the Roman Catholic Church has had on black people. That should not be too far removed for many of you if you're here in St. Louis. Because here in St. Louis, Roman Catholicism is a very, very powerful thing. <clears throat> it's St. Louis. It's not just Louis, Missouri. It's St. Louis, Missouri. And George Carey who was the Archbishop, Roman Catholic Bishop, Archbishop of Canterbury said, and the London Times recorded it, he said this on April 19th, which was Easter, Easter Sunday of, of 1992. He said these words, and I quote him, belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. Let me say that again. Belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. Did y'all get that? One more time. Belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. In other words, as Minister Stewart just read, if Christ be not risen, our preaching is vain. And your faith is also vain. If you allow me to transliterate that, what it's actually saying is this. If Jesus did not really get up out the grave, this whole thing is a lie. Y'all got that? If Jesus did not get up out the grave, this whole thing is a lie. Wow. Okay, we got a problem. 
We got a big problem. Let me tell you right now at the top of the story, Jesus did not get up out the grave. Okay? I know that was like hitting some people in the face with a sledgehammer. And I got news for y'all, for those of you who have a problem with what I just said, if you can prove in any way whatsoever with validity that he did get up out the grave, I put the same challenge out I've always put out, I'll pay all your living expenses from now to the day I die. If you can validate the resurrection of a so-called Jesus Christ, I will pay, I'm putting this out to the whole world, I will pay all y'all's living expenses <laughs> from now to the day I die. To my friends who I grew up with, who are really disturbed with me right about now, and who listen to me in secret, I'm talking to y'all too. Okay? <clears throat> For almost two millennia, for almost how long? Which is how long? 2,000 years, for almost 2,000 years, the Roman Catholic Church, which by the way, all Christian churches came out of that. Okay, whether you're Presbyterian, whether you're Methodist, whether you're Baptist, whether you're Episcopalian, whether you're Lutheran, whether you're Church of God in Christ, whether you're Church of Christ, Church of God, the Four Square Corner Church, for whatever they call it, Primitive Baptist, Southern Baptist, American Baptist, National Baptist, all, all, Progressive Baptist, all of y'all. All of y'all are Catholic. You don't realize you are simply because y'all don't confess your sins to your preacher. Some of y'all do. It's amazing he ain't confessing his sins to y'all. <clears throat> Who does he confess his sins to? That ought to tell y'all something. Whoever the preacher confesses his sins to, that's who y'all need to be confessing y'all sins to. If he, can call, if he can go to God, you can go to God. Am I making sense? Wow. The Roman Catholic Church for almost 2,000 years has taught that Jesus was crucified, died, and was bodily resurrected. Not just spiritually resurrected. Bodily resurrected means he returned to life in his original body that was put, supposedly put into the ground three days later. This is what's been taught, man. This has been long the foundational belief, not knowledge, but belief of Christian people. And there's something about believing in this thing that does not make sense, that gives them a sense of glory and happiness and empowerment. It doesn't make sense, but you believe in it. Along with the virgin birth that this woman had a baby without a man helping her. Atonement that because he shed his blood that all your sins are paid for. And the second and future coming of, of, of Jesus. Can, can, can we look at some contradictions? Let me ask y'all a question. How many contradictions do you need before you understand that something is fallible or there's a fallacy to it? How many contradictions do you need? Everybody got one finger up. Good. Let's, let's, let's find a contradiction right quick. Okay, now let's look at the Bible. Those of you who don't have your Bible, just listen real carefully. But if you will, let's go to the book of John, Minister Stewart. I want y'all to listen carefully to these accounts here. The book of John, the 20th verse. Now before she even reads that, I'm sorry, 20th chapter. 20th chapter of John, everybody say this with me. Repeat after me. The, the gospel according to John, 
is a forgery. I hope, I hope y'all don't mind me just coming raw today, but I don't feel, I, I'm, not, I'm not feeling the best, so I ain't got time to be beating around the bush, okay? But believe me when I tell you, if you can invalidate what I'm saying, I promise you, I will pay all your living expenses. I can't, I don't know if a better challenge than that. Listen, if somebody told me that all I got to do is prove what they said wrong, they pay all my living expenses, trust me. For the next three days, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't do nothing but find the proof that he's lying. Because see, I know after I find the proof, I ain't got to pay rent no more. I ain't got to pay electric bill no more. I ain't got to pay a car note no more. I ain't got to pay no food, clothing, expenses no more because he's going to pay them for me. That's better than a lottery ticket. I'm giving y'all a guarantee. Now, I don't want to make y'all think I got money. But I'm saying that because I know you can't find anything to invalidate what I'm saying. Trust me, I tried it for five years. When I came into the knowledge that everything I've been preaching was a lie, from 1993 to 1998, I tried to prove. Tried to find one thing, man, to see. And the only thing I could find was I, the, the more I searched, the more I saw how much I was lied to. By the bishops and the presiding elders and my own parents. They didn't know. They didn't know. They were. Dumb. You know what the problem was? They were teaching me what they, what somebody taught them. And when y'all sit in churches and pulpits, y'all out there watching me. When y'all sit in churches and pulpits, that's exactly what's happening. The dude in the pulpit is telling you what somebody told him. That's called hearsay. Damn, that's deep. <laughs> Living your life on hearsay. No wonder we gossip so much. <laughs> that is, that's, explain, that's why we gossip so much. We our whole life, man, that's some deep stuff. Think about that. I just said, think about, think about your whole life is built on hearsay. Look at somebody say, that ain't cool. That's why we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Minister Stewart, <laughs> Ch 20th chapter John, before we read about the resurrection account, I told y'all the book of John was a forgery. Yeah. <laughs> any scholar, any second year Bible college scout student will tell you that the book of John was added into the Bible centuries, centuries after all these other so-called books. And it had to be added for a particular reason. What was that reason? John, the 30th verse, Minister Stewart, verse 30 and 31. What does it say? And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Meaning in the book of John, not in the Bible, in the book of John. Now notice the 31st verse. The 31st verse actually tells you why they compiled the gospel according to John and put it in the Bible. It actually tells you why they did it. A lot of people look right over this. It actually tells you why they actually made this book up and put it in the Bible. What does the 31st verse say? But these are written. These or this book was written. Why? That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. Did y'all get that? Yes. It's right there in black and white. They're actually telling you the reason why this was written is so that you might believe. Not that you would know, but that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. And that's what, that's what has controlled our thinking. Now, remember, keep, what, keep in mind what she just said, and now you'll understand why I coined this phrase. Repeat this after me. 
He who controls the printed page controls the thinking of the age. Did y'all get that? In other words, the, the European historiography is what controls the thinking of the masses. They wrote it and told you it came from God and you believed it and they're controlling you like a dog on a leash. Now, let's go to the first, first verse of the 20th chapter. Let's talk about this so-called Resurrection Sunday. Go ahead, Minister Stewart. First one? Yes. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. Cometh who? Mary Magdalene. And who else? There's nobody else there but Mary Magdalene, right? By the way, this is supposed to be this is supposed to be the woman that Jesus married, by the way. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, he didn't either. <laughs> Jesus didn't have no wife. See, that's the problem. It's, that's some deep stuff how our minds are so messed up. We actually get angry over the idea that Jesus had a woman. You don't like that idea. You can't conceive that. You can't process that. Now my Lord and Savior didn't have no woman. And you want to know why the spirit of faggotism is in the church so strong. Well, he did not have a woman. He didn't have a woman because he didn't exist. <laughs> but suppose that he did exist. According to the Bible, Mary Magdalene was his woman. And the folk don't like that because Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Y'all follow what I'm saying? How could Jesus marry a prostitute? What's wrong with y'all? How dare you say such a thing? You got this lie. You done, you done elevated the lie so high that any challenge to make you think about the lie you get angry with the person's making you think y'all hear what i'm saying so the first day of the week cometh mary magdalene go ahead minister stewart now mind you according to this verse we just read only mary magdalene was there mary magdalene didn't say nobody else right Okay, and then it goes on to say, while it was yet dark. Isn't that what it says? Now I want you to keep these points in mind. One person came to the tomb and it was still dark. Go ahead. Now, according to what she's reading so far, one woman came to the tomb while it was still dark. The sun had not come up yet. And when she saw that the stone was rolled away, she did not go inside. She saw the stone was rolled away and she immediately took off running and went and told other brothers what happened. Right? Go ahead. And say unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sun. She didn't say he is risen. Mm -hmm. She did not say he is risen. She said they stole him. <laughs> Somebody stole his body. You got me? Okay, go ahead. And we know not where they have laid him. Okay, and they don't know where he is. Go ahead. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. Uh huh. So they ran both together. Here come Peter and some other disciple. They're going to come running to the tomb. Go ahead. And the other disciple did outrun Peter. Whoever this other disciple is, he was so angry about this that he outran Peter. He got there first. Are y'all seeing this here? See, you know, I really, when you really just take your time and read this like we're doing right now, you see how stupid it is. But we didn't take our time and read this. 
We just heard he got up. <laughs> With all power in his hand. <laughs> Go ahead. Read for this story. <laughs> So the first dude that got there looked into the tomb and he saw that the clothes that he was wrapped in was there, but there was no body. Go ahead. Then comes Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre. I can see Simon Peter and I'm like, man, I ain't know you can run so fast, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, ain't, ain't nobody in there. <laughs> got the picture? Okay, go ahead. And <laughs> Head, not lined with the clothes, Go ahead. Wrapped together in a place by itself. Continue. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Believed what? <laughs> what did he believe? It wasn't nothing to believe. <laughs> what he was told was somebody stole the body. You got me? So what is he believing? Go ahead. Oh, I know what I just heard a preacher talk. He believed what the Lord had said before. <laughs> well, you know, you know the Lord did say that he was gonna get up on the third day. So that's what he believing, okay. Go ahead. Verse 9, for as yet. They knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Uh-oh, that just cancels out what I just said. Now don't. <laughs> then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Now that's some deep stuff. Check this out. They went home. They came, saw the body had been stolen, and they went home. Oh well. <laughs> It's a wrap. They have stolen. We don't know where he is, so ain't nothing we can do about it. It's all over with. Let's go on home. Let's go get a beer, brother. Come on, man. Got this? But his woman didn't take it so easily. What is it going to say? But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. The brother said, let's go, man. Let's go. He's all hating. Come on, man. Ain't nobody else hanging around here. It's gone on. Ain't nothing we can do about this. It's over. You know how the brothers are. See, brothers here, you know. Hey, man. It's, hey, hey. Do they here, so let's go. You know. But Mary stood there having a fit. Crying. And go ahead. she wept. She stooped down and looked into the sepulchre. Now, now she decides to finally take a look in. When she first got there, the stone was gone, she took off running. Now she decides to look in, right? Okay. And see two angels in white sitting. I love how they always have angels dressed in white. <laughs> sitting. One at the head, go ahead. One at the hand and the other at the feet. Yes. Where the body of Jesus had laid. Yes. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Why are you crying? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. Because they somebody stole his body. And I know not where they have laid him. Okay. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. Uh oh. <laughs> oh Go ahead. And do not that it was Jesus. Now this is her man. This is her man, right? Okay. She turned around and saw this dude standing there. Okay. And she didn't know it was her husband. Go ahead. Jesus said unto her, Uh huh. Woman, why do you stop? Whom seekest thou? Now, why are you going to ask these dumb questions? Okay, I mean, who else would I be looking for, okay? And, and you know, who, who, wasn't you laying in here? 
Go ahead. She supposing him to be the gardener said unto him. How do you how do you confuse your man with the gardener, the caretaker of the of the of the the, the, the cemetery? Go ahead. Y'all relax there. Y'all relax. Go ahead. Yes. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabbi. Rabboni. Rabboni, thank yes. you. Which is to say, Master. Now this is deep. He just asked her a question. Woman, why are you crying? <laughs> Who are you looking for? And she thought he was the gardener. Now he says to her, Mary. <laughs> and now she knows who it is. <laughs> Maybe nobody can say Mary like you do. You might have had a Barry White kind of word. <laughs> Now check how deep this gets. Now go ahead. Jesus said unto her, touch me not. Okay, now check this out. Check, this is deep. This is important. This is important evidence in this case. Can we take this to court? Yes. She recognizes this is my man. And she gets ready to put her arms around her man. And he said, don't touch me. Can't touch me. Why can't she touch him? For I have not yet ascended to my father. Don't touch me because I haven't ascended to the father yet. In other words, like if you touch me, there's so much glory over me. There's so much power over me. There's so much divinity in me right now that if you touch me, you won't be able to handle it. You will die. So don't touch me because I have to ascend. Y'all see this? Yes. Don't touch me, God, and sins of God, but do what? But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Go tell the brothers that you've seen me and I'm getting ready to ascend to the Father in heaven. This is the concepts that we have in our mind. Y'all got those facts there? All right, now let's compare. Turn to Matthew. Twenty-eight, verse one. You remember the, the facts of the first presentation? Right, okay. I asked y'all, how many contradictions do you need? before you know something is not right. Everybody held up one finger. All right, let's read. Matthew 28, verse one. In the end of the Sabbath. In the end of the Sabbath. As it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. As it began to dawn. Now what did the first account say? While it was still dark, right? Okay, the sun is coming up now. Go ahead. Came Mary Magdalene. Came Mary Magdalene. And the other Mary. Wait a minute, now wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. I just asked you in the first account. Mary Magdalene and who else? And there was nobody else. So now, Jesus' other woman. <laughs> is coming along with Mary Magdalene. This is Mary, you know, the, the Mary and the Martha. Mary and Martha, y'all remember them? Okay. Well, see, Jesus supposedly married them too. Yeah, oh yeah, y'all didn't know that? Yeah. In fact, they put out a movie about it some years ago. It was called The Last Temptation of Christ. Didn't y'all see, how many of y'all saw that movie? Yeah. 
And in that movie, they're supposed to tell you that, you know, he didn't really die on the cross. He came down off the cross and married, married Mary and Martha and had children by them. So he had three wives. Now you see why they banned the movie. Couldn't take it. Just the mere, mere idea, not only of him having a prostitute as a wife, but him having more than one wife? Oh, come on. That, that. Mm -mm. Couldn't handle that, man. They boycotted that movie all over the world. Read. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Oh, now we got an earthquake, okay. <laughs> and the Lord, the angel of the Lord, descended from heaven. Now mind you, in the first account, Okay, there was nobody seen at first. She came and saw the stone had rolled away and took off running. Got the brothers, they came back and looked in the tomb and they saw two angels dressed in white inside the tomb. Now here, these two women, two women, okay, which are really are, are Isis and Nephthys and ancient comedic thought. That's where this whole thing stolen from in the first place. Y'all get me? Here we got an earthquake and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Go ahead. And came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now, this is some deep stuff because now these two women here and they actually see the angel of the Lord coming down because the stone has still got the tomb sealed and the angel comes down and he rolls back the stone and sits on top of the stone. Go ahead. His countenance was like lightning. His countenance, yes. And his rampant white stone. Yes. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead. In other words, the caretakers in the cemetery, these are men now, saw this, this being of light sitting on top of this stone. Y'all bear with me as I talk this stupidity for a moment, will you? Because it's so stupid, I'm getting frustrated talking about it. But I want y'all to see how confused we are and the mess that we've been believing and got us messed up here. So you can go share it. Go, go tell your family, you know what? I, this brother said some stuff to me that I've never thought about before. Let me share y'all with y'all right from the Bible what he shared with me so y'all can stop believing this dumb stuff. This being sitting on top of the stone, the caretakers who were brothers, men, got scared. And not only did they get scared, they got so scared that they passed out. Fainted. That's what it means they became as dead men. They fainted. Go ahead, fifth verse. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Oh, this is deep now. This angel did not ask who are you seeking? I know why y'all are here. Don't be afraid. Y'all are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Now this is some deep stuff. He is not here. For he is risen. As he said. Everybody ask yourself this question. Say with me. When did he get out of the tomb? Because the stone was still there when the ladies got there. See, I don't drop the case already. <laughs> According to what we just read, the angel came down and rolled the stone away. Right? So where did he go? How did he get out of the tomb? It was still sealed. Now, you know what most church folks say? I can hear it right now. I hear them saying it. Well, ain't nothing too hard for God. <laughs> Ain't nothing too hard for God. He, he was God. He could get out without rolling the stone away. Come on, people. Y'all see how we made the thing? Read quickly. Come see, where the, see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Yes. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, wait a minute. I thought that we just read that Jesus talked to Mary in the, in the tomb. Now we're reading, he done left y'all, he already on his way into Galilee. So go tell the disciples that that's where he's going to be. Read. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Now repeat after me. 
They left the tomb, left the tomb. With, fear with fear and great joy, great joy. and told his disciples, told his disciples. What, they had, what they had seen. Remember that. Remember that. Ninth verse, go ahead. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Okay. For the sake of time, let's move forward. Go to Mark now. And let's see how this lie comes out. Mark 16. Verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Oh, so now they're telling us the reason why they came. Here's the problem. You see, that wasn't an uncommon thing to go and because it was a rush ceremony, so they're going to take spices and wrap, you know, anointed spices to help get rid of the bad odor because they didn't have embalming fluid back then. Got what I'm saying? So they're going to anoint him with the spices and everything so his body's not stinking and da 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 da. But the problem is, why are you going to the tomb to anoint him when the tomb was sealed? You know, just like today when, you, when, they, when they lower the casket in the grave and then they put him in, in what they call a vault and then they, they put the, the big cement top on the vault right there in front of you, okay, and you know it's there, what, what, why are you going to go back and try to do something to the body? That doesn't make any sense. Read. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Okay, now the sun is uh, coming up. Go ahead. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the tomb? You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Everybody said poor planning. Poor planning. <laughs> you come in to anoint this body, but the tomb is sealed. So on your way to the tomb, you're asking yourself the question, who's going to roll the stone away for us? Go ahead. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away. Yes, go ahead. It was very great. Yes. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothing, clothed in a long white garment. Okay. And they were frightened. Okay. And he said unto them, be not frightened. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. Mm -hmm. He is risen. He is not here. Okay. Behold the place where they laid him. Okay. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. Mm -hmm. There shall you see him as he said unto you. Now check out this a verse. As I state my case. What does it say? And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre. They went out quickly and ran from the tomb. For they trembled and were amazed. For they trembled and were amazed. Now here is the, 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 the line that says you have to throw this thing out of court. What does it say? Neither said they anything to any man. For they were afraid. Did y'all miss that? Look at somebody next to you and said, according to the Bible, they did not tell anybody. Now look back at the same person said, according to the Bible, they told the disciples. Is it a contradiction? Would this stand up in court? It won't even stand up in your own mind. Now what's really interesting here is verse 9 through 18 or 9 through 20 goes on to talk about what happened thereafter. But the problem is, verses 9 through 20 were added into the Bible after the book of John was added into the Bible. 
If you look at verses 9 through 20, if you guys got a red letter edition of the Bible, it's supposed to be the words of Jesus. Right? How did Jesus say all this if it was added into the Bible? I just presented some stuff to y'all that pretty much invalidates the validity of a so-called resurrection. Brothers and sisters, on this day, we need to understand that we need to exercise common sense. Everybody said common sense ain't so common no more. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If, if this had actually happened, according to the Gregorian calendar under the Roman Catholic Church, the year of Jesus' death would have been 30. What year did I just say? 30. 30. Now let me, there's another in, in, inconsistency here. Because how old was he supposedly when he died? Oh, y'all know this. He was supposedly 33 when he died. Right? But according to the Gregorian calendar, he died in the year 30. Which means he would have had to have been born when? Come on, do the math. He would have had to have been born 3 B.C. Right? Y'all know what B.C. stand for? <laughs> B.C. stands before Christ. B.C.E. stands before the common era. So how is he going to be born before he's born? <laughs> you see what I mean when I say we don't think? But let's go with them for a moment. Here's what I want y'all to grab this. I know you never thought about this before. I want y'all to go out and share this with other people and mess up their ass there. <laughs> According to the Gregorian calendar, he would, he would have died in 30 CE, which means according to the Gregorian calendar, the resurrection before Esther Sunday, the Friday before Esther Sunday, which is the day he was supposed to have died on, right? Good Friday. Y'all with me? That date was April the 7th in the year 30. Write that down. April 7th, 30 AD. April 7th. Which means that his resurrection would have been on what day? April what? Well, April the 7th was a Friday. So the resurrection would have been April 9th. But yet he's supposed to be in the grave for three days. Thank you. Idiotic concepts. Don't make sense. He died on April 7th, was raised from the dead supposedly on April 9th. What's today's date? Today is April 8th. Why is it that every dog on year, they, they straight with his birthday? They don't get that birthday wrong. Every year, December 25th is the birthday of Jesus. That don't change. Christmas Day is Christmas Day, December 25th. I don't care if it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't care. Eight, December 25th is December 25th. April 9th should also be the same way. Why is it that his doggone resurrection date keeps changing? Christmas don't always come on a Sunday. December 25th can be any day. Why is it that April 9th, which would have been the day of his resurrection, is always falling 
Well, April 9th ain't always on a Sunday. You see, today ain't April 9th. So how is it his doggone resurrection anniversary keeps falling on Sunday? Are y'all getting this? Yes, yes. Are y'all thinking? Yes. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying? See, this really has nothing at all to do with somebody getting up out the grave. That's right. That's right. Ain't got nothing to do with that. And it's important to understand these facts, these things I'm presenting to you, because the message today is, if Christ be not risen, then the whole thing is a lie. I'm, I can't describe to you how infuriated I am with what has happened to the minds of African people yeah, that's right. because of what the Roman Catholic Church forced on us. Yes. Yes. I may have shared this with you. I was driving to Atlanta from here, going down Interstate 24 in Tennessee. And it was right after I entered into the state of Tennessee, maybe 20, 25 miles into the cross the state line, white folk talked to me. I know they're white folk, because of what it said. White ancestors spoke to me while I was driving, clear as a bell in my head, and said, why are you angry with us? And it, it, it was such a strong question that I had to start communicating back with this thing in my mind. I'm thinking, why are you, why are you angry with us? And I'm saying, why am I angry with y'all? And he spoke to me and said, why are you angry with us for lying? That's just how it came to me, man. Why are you angry with us for lying? Then they said, that's what we do. I mean, that's just how it came to me, man. You angry with us for lying. That's what we do. And then they spoke to me and said, who you ought to be angry with is your own people. Because they keep believing the lies that we made up. So that's why I talk the way I do. I've decided, y'all, I'm not going to get angry with a fish for swimming. I've decided I'm not going to get angry with a dog for barking. I've decided I'm not going to get angry with a snake for crawling. I'm not going to get angry with a mosquito for biting. You know why? Because that's what they do. That's what they do. But there's no excuse for brothers and sisters who are the sons and daughters of Mother Africa. There's no excuse for you to continue to hold on to the lies and the stupidity and the religious teachings and doctrines that were forced upon your ancestors. There's no excuse for that. There's no excuse for you to say, I'm going all the way with Jesus. <laughs> Even if it costs my life. There's no excuse for that, man. See, y'all y'all weren't where I was a couple of weeks ago in the dungeons of the Cape Coast and Amina Castles where the Christians, Christians, forced this madness on our people in the name of Christ and took them right outside those doors and put them on the very first slave ship which was called Jesus. Y'all don't know this. All you know is you're a sinner 
saved by grace. If it hadn't been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? That's a daggone shame. That black folk have to ask a question wondering if it had not been for a fabricated figure of the Roman Catholic Church on your side, where would you be? Look at somebody and say, we really messed up. And it's time for us to get it right. I close with, with these points to you. Well, there's one point, really. Brother Ray, why do we need to get it right? That's an awesome question. I want all the children in this room to stand up. Y'all have all the children in the room stand up. And all of the adults in this room, here's what I want you to say. Point to one of these young people and say, we got to get it right, get it right. For, their for their sake. We got to get it right for them. For them. We got to get it right. You know why? Because if we don't get it right, they are going to go through the same mess that we're going through now. Young people, you can be seated. Thank you. We got to get it right for them. We cannot allow this mess to get into their heads like it was in our heads growing up. Y'all hear what I'm saying? No, Jesus did not get up out the grave, period. So since he didn't get up out the grave, yes, the whole thing y'all been practicing is a lie. Yes. I'm sorry to be the one to hurt your feelings like this. Your mama should have told you better. But she didn't know any better. My mama didn't know any better. But now that I know better, my job is to tear down the lie that has been given to us, that's been designed to hold us back. Are y'all grabbing what I'm saying? It's not going to make me popular. I don't care about that. I care about you being free, black people. Man, shoot. Get rid of this sickness. Because as long as you have this sickness in your head, now I'm talking really to those who are watching. Many of you here, unless you are a visitor today and don't know any better, as long as you carry this sickness in your head, you will not do one thing to bring change in our society. And the reason why you won't do anything is because you're waiting on the Lord to do it. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You've already decided that this world ain't your home anyway. You're just a stranger passing through. Your home is in glory. That's where you're going. Well, it's really deep, y'all, because there was a time that I heard a woman, the first person I think I remember really hearing say that, her name was Alice Walker. And when she first said that, she was a fairly young woman. She was my great-grandmother. And she was in her 60s, I think, when I first heard her say that. Well, it's deep because Mother Alice Walker was waiting on the Lord to come back. She was excited and got happy over the fact that he's on his way back. That was her favorite line. You know he's on his way back. He's on his way back. I was a little boy at that time. I am now 58 years old and he hasn't gotten here yet. Mother Alice Walker is dead and gone. Her children are dead and gone. 
You follow what I'm saying? Her grandchildren, some of them are dead and gone. Her great-grandson said, hell, I ain't going through that. I'm going to tell y'all something differently. I'm going to tell you he ain't coming back. So once you, once you understand he ain't coming back, maybe you'll get up off your behind and realize that the only way change and improvement is going to come in your life, in your community, in your neighborhood, is if you get up and do something about it. Am I making sense here? Get up off your knees. Stop calling for somebody out there in space to come rescue you.